In this video, we're going to have a look at the different elements of culture. And as you can see from the diagram here, there are quite a few. Given that over the last few weeks we've already covered political and economic philosophies of nations and societies, we're going to sort of leave them out for this week and instead focus on the remaining four, that is social structures, religions, language and education. Let's go through each of these one by one. And we'll start with social structure, which refers to a society's base, basic social organisation. Uh, for the majority, this considers firstly the degree to which the basic unit of social organisation is the individual as opposed to the group or the collective, and secondly the degree to which society is, uh, can be broken down or classified into different social classes or castes. Now, why is this important for international business? Well, firstly, consider more of an individual-oriented society. What research has tended to indicate is that these exhibit higher levels of entrepreneurial activity. And as we discussed last week, this is especially important and strongly linked to higher levels of economic development. There's also, in a, an individual-oriented society, usually high degrees of managerial mobility. What that means, and why that is important, is that most managers in an individual society tend to be more interested in their own individual career prospects than the well-being of the larger uh, organisation. Obviously, this presents both opportunities and challenges for us as international business managers, uh, especially when it comes to attracting uh, and retaining uh, the key personnel that we're looking to have within our organisation. The opposite tends to be true within a group-oriented society. Most employees tend to be much more loyal and potentially even obtain lifetime employment. And again, that presents its own set of challenges in terms of keeping them motivated within a single organisation. And there's also typically an expectation of close cooperation and more group-oriented goals and outcomes and in even rewards uh, within a group-oriented society. As we mentioned before, it's also important to understand the role that different social classes or castes play within different societies. It certainly has a significant uh, influence and, and outcomes uh, or implications rather, for employability. There will certainly be expectations in some societies that only certain types of people from certain social classes will be provided with opportunities in certain roles. So you'll need to be of course conscious of that if you're looking to expand overseas and looking to staff your organisation. The issue of class or social caste uh, consciousness is also a big one for individual international business managers. What we mean here is that most employees within the society often identify themselves as belonging to a particular social group. And as a consequence of that, there's traditionally been a fair degree of antagonism between a number of different social groups in certain countries. So even within a number of Western societies like Britain, uh, over, going back over the last few decades, there's often been a bit of a clash between these, these sort of lower socioeconomic groups and, and social classes, uh, which are commonly comprised of lower level employees, and the higher class sort of uh, managerial groups that are typically found within organisations. And obviously being able to manage uh, those clashes and, and those differences is a key part of ensuring that your international business is able to be successful as it continues to expand overseas. The next element of culture we're going to look at here is religion. And this refers to a system of shared beliefs and rituals that are concerned with the realm of the sacred. And obviously that will be determinant on the key or dominant religion in a particular society. It's certainly one of the major determinants of overall cultural values and, and plays a large role in shaping the ethical systems that we see within a particular uh, social society. Uh, and these refer, of course, to the moral principles and values of what is right and wrong. On a global scale, we tend to identify four major religions which dominate society. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. And certainly, if you believe Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights, also Tom Cruise and his Scientologist friends. Confucianism is also important in influencing behaviour and culture, especially in uh, large parts of Asia. From an Australian perspective, that's obviously quite important. So understanding uh, the different religions will go a long way towards helping you better understand the expectations of society, given that those principles of what is perceived to be right and wrong are largely shaped by a religion, but also help you understand 
what individuals within your organisation, uh, how what they believe to be appropriate and inappropriate courses of action. The next element of culture we're going to look at is language. Now this refers to the spoken and also unspoken means of communication. Now the spoken is fairly straightforward, obviously, whenever we actually converse with somebody from another culture, uh, that's a fairly obvious way to communicate uh, and, and to use language. But the unspoken forms of language, those non-verbal forms of communication, are often uh, the most powerful of all. And we've got a few examples here, things like facial expressions, you only have to look at the uh, expression on Michelle Obama's face to understand exactly what she's thinking in that particular moment in time. Personal space is another big one. Here in Australia, as you can see here, it's considered odd when somebody is standing very close to you. But certainly if you're in somewhere like Latin America, there's an expectation that people stand somewhere within three to feet, five feet of you when conducting a business transaction. And certainly, as you can see here, we would think that is either weird or funny. Hand gestures are another good example here. If you see that, certainly in a country like Australia, straight away we think that means okay. But in other countries like France, that means zero. In other countries such as Japan, it's made in relation to money. And if you make that when you're in Brazil, then you'll effectively be saying up yours to somebody from that local culture. So it's important, obviously, to understand exactly what you are saying. Uh, through different forms of not just spoken but also unspoken language. What we tend to find, perhaps not surprisingly, is that countries with more than one language often have more than one culture. So India, for example, has a number of languages which are spoken within that country uh, which are often linked to the different cultures that we see there. Canada is another good example. Uh, a lot of people within Canada do speak English, but there are also many French uh, speakers within that particular country who identify themselves as French Canadians. So those different cultures and different uh, social uh, groups within a single country are often linked to the different languages that are spoken. On a global scale, English is certainly the most widely spoken language in the world and, and more than ever today is the language of international business. There are a few countries that don't have any proficiency in international business dealings uh, when it comes to English. On the other hand, Chinese is the mother tongue of the largest number of people. From a, so from a purely numbers perspective, uh, Chinese languages are more commonly spoken than any other. What does this all mean for you guys as future international, international business managers? Obviously, knowledge of the local language is, is certainly beneficial and, and in some cases actually crucial to ensure your business's success as it seeks to expand overseas or even just conduct business with somebody from another country. Failing to understand uh, not just the spoken but these non-verbal cues of another culture can actually lead to serious communication failure. And we've got a few more humorous takes on exactly what happens in that type of situation included at the bottom of your page there for you to have a look at. It's also important when we talk about language in terms of an as an element of culture to understand that cross-cultural communication is heavily dependent upon the context in which it takes place. So it's not just what you say or even what you don't say, it's the way in which or the context and environment and surroundings in which that communication takes place which have a heavy influence on the overall meaning of what is actually being said. So the context refers to the information that surrounds communication and helps to understand or decipher the message in that communication. Broadly speaking, we see two types of context. Low context, which is where the spoken words explicitly and very clearly convey the messages, mess, the speaker's message to the listener rather. And also high context cultures, which is where the context of the discussion is as important as the spoken words and potentially even more so than the spoken words in certain cultures. And the clues, uh, cultural clues here become quite important. To illustrate this on our next slide, we can see a basic ranking of low context to high context cultures. You can see here in Australia, we are much more on the low context side. 
we tend to be fairly direct and potentially even quite blunt uh, with the way in which we communicate. At the other end of the scale, we see the Chinese culture where the environment and the setting in which the communication takes place often plays as large a part, large a part in determining the meaning of that communication in the first place. The final element of culture that we're going to look at today is education. Now, this refers to the medium through which individuals learn many of the language, conceptual and mathematical skills that are indispensable not only in society at large, but especially within international business. Now, within this particular context, it's important for a few reasons. First, it's vital in determining a nation's competitive advantage. So, the more highly educated uh, a nation's workforce are, the more useful they're going to be in higher value added uh, industries. So, for example, if you're an IT firm looking to expand overseas and you're looking to establish a plant in a particular target market, you're more likely to want a, a target market that has higher educational levels so that you can have these highly skilled workers working within your overseas operations. General education levels can also be a good index for the kind of products that might do well in a particular country. So for example, if you're an Australian manufacturer of red scarves, straight to Korea where we see the national uniform as depicted in that illustration there. Or if you're an overseas manufacturer of beer, then might targeting the Gold Coast around school these times might be a surefire way to earn a nice little profit. But on a serious level, it certainly is a good indicator overall for the potential success of certain items and products. So obviously in a society with higher levels of education, the people and consumers within that particular country are much more likely to be demanding uh, of sophisticated and high tech products. On the other hand, in a society or country with lower levels of education, you may not want products or the, the people there are less likely to be demanding of such sophisticated products. And so if you were looking to sell something into that particular target market, you might not want to overload your product with certain sophisticated features, for example. So overall, we can see that having a clear understanding of each of these different elements of culture is going to be really vital for you guys as future international business managers to ensure the success of your international operations.